We only have 18. Sorry. We should be fine. I think we're over 12, okay, over 11. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Yeah, we're good. We're live. Good afternoon. Welcome to the House Judiciary Committee. It is the 25th of February, 2021. Uh, we only have three bills today now. We won't know what to do with ourselves, um, but uh, we have three bills. House Bill 68, which was announced um, and advertised uh, up until just today, was just withdrawn by Delegate Talmadge Branch. So we will not be hearing House Bill 68. We're gonna begin with House Bill 169 and Delegate Valentino Smith. Uh, Delegate Valentino Smith will talk for three minutes then we'll hear from Gavin Potashnik, James Johnston, Hannah Breakstone, and Alicia Capozello from the Office of the Public Defender. So we'll go with that. All right, uh, Delegate Valentino Smith, please. Mr. Chair, members of the Judiciary Committee, very excited to be here today on House Bill 169, which is informal adjustment. You remember it well. We passed it last year as House Bill 842, tremendous momentum coming out of this committee, but we got shut down in the last days of COVID. Um, I'm very proud House Bill 842 was referenced by the Juvenile Justice Council on page seven in a footnote as being the foundation for their recommendations for informal adjustment. And I really wanna thank the chairman and all the members that spent so much time working on the council to come forward with the report that you're soon to hear about. So House Bill 169 embodies the landmark agreement between the state's attorneys, the Office of Public Defender, and um, DJS. We've been working for many, many years, some before not all of you were born, but certainly all of you were on the Judiciary Committee. Um, and it, it embodies um, what we think was most important to show the philosophy of juvenile law, which is really that it's about rehabilitation and it is not about findings of guilt. Um, there are some slight differences um, in the bill between what you're going to hear in 169 and 187. There are some differences in the um, waiver and whether or not you can retry an informal adjustment if you failed, but nevertheless, it's very similar um, to what you're going to hear about. Uh, there's no doubt that informal, I don't see the clock, am I doing okay? But <laughs> there's, you're gonna hear a lot of testimony. But let's just say, after many years of working on this issue, I'm enthusiastic to see that it is got, or continues to have the momentum. Four out of five youth that completely go through informal adjustment um, don't end up back in court. 90% uh, of the youth place do not have any offenses after they're adjudicated. You know the wisdom of this bill. You've already passed it once. It's a privilege to be here and enthusiastic that this issue continues to have momentum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. We'll hear now from Gavin Potashnik for two minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman and Vice Chair, members of the committee, Gavin Potashnik, Deputy State Attorney for Harford County. Uh, before I took this job, I used to work for the Department of Juvenile Services. Before that, I used to be the chief of the juvenile division in the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office. I see some of my friends who are also uh, here in support of the bill. I will say it is actually pretty rare that we have a hearing where the Public Defender's Office, the State's Attorneys and the MSAA, as well as Department of Juvenile Services all agree on a particular issue. Is that informalization, if done correctly, is a useful and well-used uh, uh, tool that can really help kids uh, not get to a court situation. Um, one of the things that I have noticed here in Harper County is that there's kind of an informal agreement to conduct just this, House Bill 169, where we call it a remand to the Department of Juvenile Services. The problem with a remand is that once a youth is sent back to the Department of Juvenile Services after the consent of all parties and the child, the child's attorney, the Department of Juvenile Services really doesn't have any legal ability to do any programming for that child and really it just boils down to a glorified stat. If this was a legitimate statutory uh, a tool that we could use, then we could harness the power of the Department of Juvenile Services to provide actual program for kids in situations where it really is most effective for that individual to be remanded to the Department of Juvenile Services for further programming and informal adjustment. Um, the, the MSAA and myself, we think this is a great tool uh, and we ask for a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. For uh, James Johnston, please. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is James Johnson, I'm the Legislative Director for the Department of Juvenile Services. I will be very brief. We strongly support this bill. Uh, we commend the sponsor for her uh, very hard work to push this forward last year and then again to champion this issue. This year, we strongly believe this creates another pathway uh, for those youth where everyone involved, prosecutor, judge, public defender, young person recognize that going through the DJS informal process is the best way to resolve that case. It avoids formal case processing in those um, circumstances where it's appropriate. Uh, and we think this is a terrific bill and we're excited to be here strongly supporting it. We would absolutely urge a favorable report and I'm happy to answer any questions, any technical issues uh, that might be outstanding. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Hannah Breakstone, please. members of the committee. My name is Hannah Breakstone, and I'm here on behalf of Advocates for Children of Youth. Advocates for Children and Youth is supporting Bill 169. ACY builds a strong Maryland by advancing policies and programs to ensure children and families of every race, ethnicity, and place of birth achieve their full potential. HB 169 would expand the use of informal adjustment by allowing a court to refer petitions back to DJS when certain circumstances are met. It should be specially noted that this process spares children the consequences of a juvenile criminal record that can follow them throughout their entire lives. ACY recognizes clear benefits of expanding this form of diversion, which would lead to better public safety outcomes, lower recidivism rates for youth within one year, as well as throughout life um, when they become adults, better educational and attendance outcomes, and quicker, more appropriate accountability that is more meaningful for youth development. A report by the Maryland Department of Juvenile Services detailed that 91% of youth who had their incidents handled through informal adjustment did not reoffend within the next year. An informal adjustment also means young people who are successful will avoid the possibility of detention and commitment in an out of home placement. Young people who have a formal court appearance are significantly more likely to drop out of school. Youth incarceration directly decreased high school graduation rates by 13% and increased the young person's likelihood of being incarcerated as an adult by 22%. In 2020, approximately 48% of cases were referred to the state's attorney, but were resolved in intake or determined to be outside of the system's jurisdiction. Only 13% of all complaints referred to DJS resulted in an informal adjustment. We see success that similar legislation has had in other states like Florida, Kentucky, Answer any questions of the benefits ACY sees for this bill and ask the committee for a favorable report on HB 169. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would say uh, for future, uh, if you're going to testify a little later today, uh, Ms. Breakstone, your microphone was awful. Your remarks were fine, but your, your microphone was not. So we may have Thank to talk about the audio. Um, Alicia Capozello, please, from the Office of the Public Defender. Thank you, Mr. V Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Alicia Capazello. I'm a supervising attorney with the Maryland Office of the Public Defender, where I've represented young people exclusively for over 20 years. I'm a graduate of the Child Law Fellowship Program at Loyola University Chicago and a Georgetown University Capstone Fellow in Youth Diversion. I'm here to testify in support of House Bill 169 with amendments. Diversion, also called informal adjustment under Maryland law, must be expanded and utilized in a more racially equitable manner. While House Bill 169 is a step toward this, it does not go far enough. The amendments that are necessary are provisions in House Bill 1187, namely require informal adjustment of misdemeanors, excluding handgun possession and nonviolent felonies for all youth who have not previously been adjudicated delinquent, eliminate the requirement of state's attorney approval for informal adjustment of nonviolent felonies, and require victim notification rather than victim consent. One of the most important benefits of diversion is reducing recidivism. Research has shown that youth placed in diversion programs such as multi-systemic therapy or victim youth restorative conferences reoffend up to 45% less often than youth who were formally charged and processed in juvenile courts. In Maryland, as you've heard, 80% of young people successfully complete diversion and 90% who complete it do not recidivate within one year. Despite this, Maryland formally charges and processes 
significantly high percentages of misdemeanors and felonies and does so in a racially inequitable manner. Youth of color are more likely to have their cases charged and less likely to be offered diversion for both misdemeanors and felonies. This bill with amendments will reduce racial disparities caused by discretionary decision-making and will expand diversion by eliminating barriers to it, all while preserving the state's attorney's ability to charge a case if diversion is unsuccessful and increasing overall victim satisfaction, including higher rates of restitution recovery. Thank you. It would be my pleasure to answer any questions. Other questions for the panel, Delegate McComas. Um, a question for uh, anybody in the panel, what type of um, basically activities when you refer it back to juvenile services would the, would the kids be able to uh, work with? In other words, you, you may find one kid does well doing one thing, another. In other words, do you have um, buy-in by the community that has uh, control over different programs to, to help these kids? Delegate. Maybe the Okay. It's, my experience has been that DJS has a diverse set of tools that they use that are kind of crafted towards what they think the best needs of the juvenile are. But I guess Jay from DJS might be able to provide more detail on the on the processes that are used. They're highly successful and usually a little bit different in each place, depending on the case and the jurisdiction. Jay? Yeah, thank you. Dally McCombs for the question. And, um... I, I would absolutely agree uh, with what uh, Delegate Valentino Smith said. We have a continuum of services. It could be everything from restitution uh, to community service to counseling, uh, really a wide range of options for those young people who are appropriate to handle informally um, through that pre-court supervision process. Um, just a follow-up question. Uh, basically, do you use the carrot and the stick approach? In other words, let's say, uh, 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 let's say I'll use a, a young black man is very interested, black black child is very interested in, in basketball, and he doesn't. He basically is not on a team or anything. But do you you want him to do the restitution or whatever? But do you try to connect him with somebody that can help him with coaching so that? Uh, the child finds a better focus in life, something positive as opposed to getting in trouble. Uh, that's what I, that's what I was kind of looking for, the carrot and stick approach that that basically, um, you know, works with the child and works with their strengths instead and not just focus on the weakness. Absolutely. Um, we're always looking to make linkages, you know, even if it's, um, you know, apart from, say, the, the restitution or the community service issue, make linkages with services in the community, positive uh, behavior uh, that could be uh, you know, fostered in the community. So absolutely, we would want to link someone with uh, a program or an activity that can continue well beyond that person's involvement with the department. Hey, what's up? Delegate Cardin, you need to go on mute. Okay. Further questions? Okay. Delegate Cardin, you still need to go on mute. Delegate Cardin. Please take yourself, thank you, uh, Delegate Grammer for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask, could you briefly walk us through how this, uh, how this with the system would practically work if this bill were implemented? Just from my understanding. Is that something, Gavin, you wanna work yeah, through? Sure, I can do that. So, so Delegate Grammer, think about it this way. Um, if, if a child goes through, uh, is referred to the Department of Juvenile Services, and for whatever reason, the Department of Juvenile Service is either unwilling or unable or cannot perform an informal adjustment. They then forward the matter to the state's attorney's office for petitioning. We file a petitioning, a petition which uh, accounts for kind of a formal document that goes to court, at which point then there is an arraignment and adjudication that is set. Um, if at, the way this legislation would work is that at any point in time, if the child, the child's attorney and the state's attorney, the assistant state's attorney agree uh, on motion, then the petition essentially would be halted and the entire matter would go back to the Department of Juvenile Services for informal adjustment. If successful, the petition gets dismissed. If not successful, then the state would, would continue with the, um, with the adjudication and court intervention uh, provide the a rehabilitative service or, or, or whatever the disposition would be. And can you give me a couple examples why you would choose to take this course? Sure. 
a, a really good example um, is it happens all the time where we have a corporate victim. So for instance, if I have a, a child and the child steals something from a 7-Eleven, right? Um, and the child is then referred to the Department of Juvenile Services. The way that the current informal statute would apply is the Department of Juvenile Services has to get the permission of the victim in order to do so. Well, you know, a lot of times you can't get express consent from 7-Eleven Corporation or whoever owns it, or they never get a response. So they're forced then to send the case to the department, to, to the state attorney's office, and 99 out of 100 times we will file a petition um, because there has to be some accountability and we're following that rule. And then again, you can argue we should or we shouldn't, but that's just generally what happens. Right. Um, once we get to the education phase, there's no need for us to really do it when informally could have handled that. Another great example is that, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, people who uh, don't have means, they move around a lot. So they'll get a letter from the Department of Juvenile Services to attend an informal adjustment meeting and they never get the letter. So they don't know when to attend they fail to show up for an informal meeting and the Department of Juvenile Services is again forced to send the case to the state attorney's office for petitioning. Not that the, the child and the parent uh, wouldn't have participated in formal adjustment, but they, for whatever means that are not their fault, they were unable to and the case just moves forward under the regular scheme. Okay, is this mostly cases of like efficiency or are there other examples why you would do this? Uh, sure. I mean, a lot of times, too, if a child uh, tells the Department of Juvenile Services, I didn't do it, I want a trial, and then we get to an adjudication, and that the child has a, a, you know, a change of heart, understands they, are, they have grown in that time period, the, the victim really only wants their restitution for a broken window or what have you, you know, there really isn't any need then to place a child on unnecessary supervision for the express purpose of providing restitution, when this is a much more efficient uh, way to accommodate that accountability and that rehabilitation component of the Juvenile Causes Act. So there's a myriad of different ways this could be used. Like I said, we already do this in Hartford County. The only problem is, is that if we want to add a program, the Department of Juvenile Services doesn't have the legal authority to extend that program because they can't provide supervision. They can't take restitution because they don't have a legal authority to do so this bill would provide that legal authority. So it's, it's actually helpful for us. Okay, all right, thanks for the answers. Are there further questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very, very much. And um, we'll probably be hearing from several of you again here in a moment. Uh, but thank you, that concludes the testimony of House Bill 169. Thank you, Delegate Valentino Smith very much. We're now going to hear from Delegate Crutchfield for House Bill 1121. Delegate Crutchfield has um, three people, herself and two others, who are going to testify, herself for three minutes, Jenny Egan and James Johnston. Jenny Egan from OPD, James Johnston from the Department of Juvenile Services, and we'll hear one person in opposition. Uh, Delegate Crutchfield, if you're ready, we'll hear House Bill 1121. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone, Vice Chair Atterbury um, and members of the Judiciary Committee. So for the record, I am Delegate Charlotte Crutchfield and I represent District 19 in Montgomery County. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, testify in support of this bill. House Bill 1121 is following the theme you just heard from um, in the previous bill, is a result of the um, recommendations issued by the Juvenile Justice um, Reform Council that were issued to the General Assembly in January. So what this bill simply does is it requires the Department of Juvenile Services and the Department of Human Services to convene a work group to ensure that prevention and intervention services delivered to children and juveniles in the areas of child welfare, juvenile mental health, and ju juvenile rehabilitation be primarily evidence-based, research-based, and also culturally competent practices are used. So what it also does is it really requires this work group to create a baseline um, of all of these types of um, assessments. And then it will require that the work group come up with an inventory which is a listing of all those kinds of diversionary services that would be provided. That would again be evidence-based, research-based, and also engage in culturally competent practices. 
So that is really this bill. Um, and most importantly, this bill would provide objective information about which programs achieve the desired outcomes, such as reduced recidivism and improved health. So I'm asking for your support on this bill, HB 1121, to ensure that again, prevention and intervention services delivered to children and juveniles by the Department of Juvenile Services are primarily evidence-based, research-based, and cult culturally competent. So I urge you to just vote favorably for House Bill 1121. Thanks. All right, Jenny Egan, go ahead for two minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee. Thank you, Delegate Crutchfield, for this important bill. Uh, I am Jenny Egan. I'm a juvenile public defender in Baltimore City, uh, and I am here to testify very briefly in support of this bill. The inventory and this bill has been modeled other places. Uh, in Washington, it's the WISPY, um, and that is provided in our written testimony, the references. So often as we move and as this committee has pushed the law in Maryland to towards evidence-based and promising practices, it's hard to know what those things mean unless we have uh, some agreed upon definitions and understanding. In the juvenile justice system and in the child welfare system, we should have a good sense of what programs work to address what issues. That currently doesn't happen. For example, in the juvenile justice system, if we have a child uh, who has a theft problem, what is the best intervention for that young person? If we have a child who has gang involvement, what is the best interventions proven to work around that? We need to create standard and shared definitions as well as an inventory of those programs that are most culturally uh, competent, appropriate and available in Maryland. So I urge your uh, enthusiastic favorable vote on this bill and thank you Delegate Crutchfield for introducing it. James Johnston. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is James Johnson with the Department of Juvenile Services. Uh, we would urge a favorable report on HB 1121 um, to second uh, what uh, Ms. Egan said briefly. Uh, this uh, would, um, I think, be an important step. It mirrors a recommendation from the uh, Juvenile Justice Reform Council. And it's important as well with our crossover youth, pra youth practice model. So we all collaborate with the Department of Human Services, and we would look forward to working with our partners there to come up with this inventory, really research the evidence-based practices that we're engaging in now, uh, and then might be suitable to uh, engage in in the future, and we would urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. Are there questions regarding the legislation for this panel? Seeing none, thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll hear to the one from the one person in opposition, Vince McAvoy. All right, we don't have Vince in the uh, waiting room. And so we'll just note for the record his opposition to the bill. And that concludes the testimony for House Bill 1121. Now, we have just a brief short bill. House Bill 1187, um, which is my bill, um, and it comes from the work of uh, the Juvenile Justice Council, and so I'm going to set myself a clock for three minutes and see if I can hit it. All right, I'm very happy to be here to present the committee House Bill 1187, the legislation uh, that is the result of extensive work over the last two years by the Juvenile Justice Reform Council. It moves Maryland in the direction of providing more evidence-based, data-informed, and culturally competent services and programs for, juvenile justice, for juveniles who are engaged in our juvenile justice system. Again, it's a culmination of two years uh, of work and public engagement. I attended a couple of the public hearings that, that happened prior to uh, COVID shutting everything down. Um, and I served uh, on the JJRC, it was chaired by uh, one of the people you're gonna hear from in the moment, the Secretary of the Department of Juvenile Services, Sam Abed. Betsy Tolentino is gonna to be available for technical questions from the committee. Nate Bayless, who also served on the council is gonna be here from the Casey Foundation, along with Jenny Egan from OPD, and Marta Nelson, who uh, from Vera, uh, the uh, organization that provided technical assistance. As this committee knows, we passed the legislation that authorized the Juvenile Justice uh, Reform Council in 2019. 
legislation that had been introduced. I, I had introduced it, uh, Senator Ferguson had introduced it prior to that time in uh, 2018. Um, it, this legislation certainly reflects the, uh, some of the legislation that has been introduced this year by uh, the uh, subcommittee chair for the juvenile, uh, for juvenile and family law, Delegate uh, Charlotte Crutchfield. And I do wanna recognize her for the, her work in this, in this area. This legislation does take on some of the issues that she has identified uh, uh, as a member of this committee. Also, as you heard from uh, Delegate Valentino Smith, this legislation also addresses issues related to informal adjustment. Although, as she mentioned before, her bill is a little bit different than what is in, in here. Um, this legislation is really a first step towards a comprehensive, a first step in the comprehensive review of juvenile justice in Maryland a step taken with broad consensus from all of the partners in this area, from state's attorneys to the Office of Public Defender and to the Department of uh, Juvenile Services. It's worth mentioning that there will be a second step that will need to be taken, and that is identified in the bill, where we will look at, uh, in a continued work of the council, at the programming provided by the Department of Juvenile Services, and also the direct file process by which children are charged as adults. So the bill will extend the, length, the uh, length of the council to address those issues. This bill makes significant changes that seek to divert young people from entering the, juvenile, the uh, juvenile justice system in the first place, in part by, by expanding the informal adjustment process. The age for jurisdiction would be raised to 13, except in cases involving serious violent crimes. And it, it creates an independently validated risk scoring instrument to determine and provide guidance as to whether a child should be put in detention in the first place. It also seeks to keep kids out of jail for committing or being alleged to have committed misdemeanors unless that offense involves a firearm. It also deals with issues related to juvenile probation. It is a very comprehensive piece of legislation that uh, took a lot of work and a lot of time. There are some details still in the bill that may, may need to be addressed, but. Having said that, it has been my pleasure to work with Jenny Egan, to work with the other members of the council to put together a very good product for you today. And with that, I will now pass it over to, uh, I will pass it over to begin with Jenny Egan and we'll go in this order. It'll be Jenny Egan. Um, actually, I'm sorry, Jenny, I apologize for this. We actually should go with the secretary first. It is his department, I guess, I think, right? So we'll go with Sam Abed for, for uh, two minutes. Then we'll go with Jenny Egan, Nate Bayless, and Marta Nelson. Uh, Betsy Tolentino is going to uh, bat clean up if uh, people have technical questions. So with that, Mr. Secretary, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Madam Vice Chair Atterbury, uh, members of the committee, Sam Abbott, Secretary for the Department of Juvenile Services. And I am uh, testifying in support of House Bill uh, 1187. And uh, I, I echo everything that Chairman Clippinger said. This was a uh, really an all-star group. And you could take any of those people that uh, the chairman mentioned in any order, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because they have all, uh, so much knowledge and, uh, and interest in this field, just as I do. Um, so I would like to start with expressing my sincere thanks to everybody uh, who served on the Juvenile Justice Reform Council. We had 34 people in total uh, serve over those two years uh, with a rich and diverse background of knowledge and experience. Uh, and they shared that expertise and absorbed a tremendous amount of information between meetings, uh, as well as during the presentations by our partners uh, from the various institutes of justice. And they took all of that and used it to inform the discussion uh, about how things currently are within our juvenile justice system and how they should be. We completed 16 listening sessions uh, that were organized by local management boards all around the state last year. And we had 530 citizens take the time to show up and personally give their viewpoints. Uh, we were very fortunate to complete all of our listening sessions in person. However, our meeting schedule was interrupted by COVID in March and uh, that put tremendous time pressure on the council to complete our work. Uh, but we were able to regroup into online council meetings and redouble our meeting schedule to accomplish uh, most of what we set out to do. As the chairman mentioned, we submitted a report in January and it details uh, the areas where we think additional review is needed 
Um, however, the bill before you today brings together all of the substantive recommendations that we were able to uh, consider and make after uh, this council of experts uh, thoroughly vetted the data and carefully evaluated the policy implications. Uh, and our, at, I'm just going to go through a little bit about our, our council members. It consisted of legislators, as you know, state agency representatives from all of the agencies that touch youth in Maryland, the public defender, a representative of the state's attorneys association, uh, national experts like uh, Marta Nelson, as was mentioned, and her team from Vera, as well as the Annie Casey Foundation, state and national academic researchers who specialize in youth justice, advocates, practitioners, and two youth who have been through our system. Um, it was an honor to chair such a group of high esteem and in anticipation of this moment today uh, for this bill hearing, it was my goal to ensure that what we presented had broad support from the council. And when you think of the breadth of viewpoints represented, it can be hard to imagine that we could get to consensus. Mr. Secretary, I, I sadly have to start to ask you to wrap up on my own. But sec Secretary, if you please start to wrap up. All right, all right, all right. Well. Uh, bottom line is, uh, as, as the chairman mentioned earlier, I, I don't want to retread too much, we had broad consensus. Uh, and we had, uh, I'll just say, the, the two polls on this group were, were Ms. Egan, who you'll hear from, and uh, our state's attorney's rep, uh, Scott Schellenberger. And on all of the substantive issues, uh, not the procedural ones, but all the substantive ones, they both voted yes. And I think that gives you a good sense of the broad consensus that we had on this uh, council. So um, uh, I want to just say that I fully support House Bill 1187 because the science and the best evidence strongly suggest that these reforms are the right way to make a more fair system. And for those reasons, I urge a favorable report. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Jenny Egan, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman. So adolescence is a time when children start asking the world, uh, start to ask, who am I going to be in this world? And I promise you, despite how much all the teenagers in your life roll their eyes, I work with young people every day and they are listening to what the world and the adults in their life tell them in response to that question. When we put handcuffs on a child, when we put a young person in a cage, we are sending them a message. This is who you are. This is what we think you deserve. And the children who are hearing that message in Maryland are overwhelmingly and, and to a disturbing extent, black. The fact is the vast majority of kids who commit crimes grow out of it on their own without any system intervention. A quality juvenile justice system is a, one that allows kids who touch the system to go through that maturation process uh, as the vast majority of kids who do and move out of the system and targets its interventions for uh, the high quality interventions for young people who need more support and need more intervention to uh, successfully transition out of criminality into an adulthood. This bill is a historic opportunity to take the first step to correct the problems in the juvenile justice system in Maryland. The JJRC was able to dive deep into these sticky, difficult issues and come up with workable, pragmatic solutions that make our communities and Maryland as a whole stronger and more vibrant. The bill, bill does four major things. It raises the age of minimum court jurisdiction so Maryland can stop criminalizing normal, childish elementary school behavior. It limits probation to finite terms that are developmentally appropriate so that kids can understand the goals they're aiming for. It bans youth incarceration for misdemeanor offenses and technical violations of, of probation, like skipping school. And it removes some of the major barriers to diversion that exists in the juvenile system currently, but not in the adult system. COVID, uh, and, and I tell you, this is a first step in the process, but I want you to understand that these reforms need to happen now, not in a year, not in five, because we have a window of opportunity like we have never had before. Uh, over the last year of COVID, youth incarceration rates have plummeted across the state and stayed down. The number of young people incarcerated pretrial who are charged in juvenile court has dropped nearly 70%. Last week, there were only 55 kids in jail facilities pending trials in juvenile court. Youth prison populations have dropped 64%. Out-of-state placements have dropped 86%. DJS has closed two youth prisons due to the declining numbers. And there's been no accompanying crime wave. I know, I'm wrapping up. Hordes right. of children have not descended on every local mall, Lord of the Flies style. In fact, juvenile complaints are down 50 to 60% 
and they, they dropped that much at the beginning of COVID and they've stayed down. It's hard to shift focus and change course when you're also running a very large system. And we know that from you, you've done this work for so long. This is a historic opportunity to shift our focus and improve our system. I urge you to vote favorably on HB 1887 uh, and, and help us transition from a system that tells our kids you deserve a cage to one that tells our kids you deserve all the opportunity in the world. And we, we as the people in charge wanna give it to you. Thank you very much. We're all very enthusiastic. Uh, uh, Nate Bayless, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. As the director of the Juvenile Justice Strategy Group at the Annie Casey Foundation, my focus is on youth justice policy and practice across the country. With that national landscape in mind, I was honored to serve on the JJRC here in my home state. The council came about at the right time with the right charge, and ultimately, I believe, the right set of recommendations for the legislature to con consider. Why? Because I believe the council demonstrated that by sticking to our charge of being data driven and focused on the research and best practices, we built consensus around a set of policies that lay the groundwork for a system that is frankly more worthy of the young people, families and communities it serves. A system more discerning about which young people should ever be considered for prosecution or confinement, more effective at steering young people away from continued involvement and towards services and supports in their communities and more equitable so that the racial disparities that have come to define the youth justice system here and, and across the country no longer define youth justice here in Maryland. As someone with an eye at the national level, I see reflected in House Bill 1187, a desire for youth justice in Maryland to catch up to the research, something that I believe is already in motion. I believe this legislation positions Maryland to be a leader in the youth justice field without getting too far in front of it. The well-established research on the dangers of secure detention and incarceration helps shape the council's recommendations on putting reasonable limitations on who can be locked up in the state. The adolescent brain research informed recommendations on expanding the use of diversion and limiting the time young people can be on probation. I'm especially pleased that the council moved beyond concerns about confinement to diversion and probation as well. When we think about the young people who we care about in our lives, we understand that while pushing boundaries of authority is normal, being put on indeterminate probation supervision is not. The goal here has to be to limit system involvement and build connections and supports for young people that can last, rather than the expectation that probation is the change agent forever. We want young people to thrive and build a sense of intrinsic value. For young people, this can and should be achieved away from the system for most of them. But if probation is needed to set them on the right path, it can't be the long-term answer. If after six months or 12 months or 24 months, probation has failed to build those connections and supports, surely at that point, continued probation involvement is more likely to build resentment than resolve. I believe these recommendations have sought to give youth justice system in Maryland more purpose, effectiveness, and fairness. This legislation is a big step in promoting all three, and I'm strongly in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Bayless. Marta Nelson, please. Good afternoon, I'm Marta Nelson. I'm Director of Government Strategy at the Vera Institute of Justice. Vera is a national nonprofit that works to build justice and ensure fairness, promote safety, and strengthen communities. The Juvenile Justice Reform Council engaged Vera to analyze and share Maryland data about children in the juvenile system, looking particularly at issues of race equity and safety. Vera also shared national practice on the key issues before the council. I led this work for Vera and had the privilege of attending council meetings throughout the fall. Council's recommendations impressively take on the breadth of issues facing Maryland children drawn to the juvenile justice system. This soup to nuts approach puts Maryland ahead of its peers who have tackled issues piecemeal, improving some parts of their system while allowing others to languish. Each of these recommendations is informed by data, comparison of Maryland's practices with other states and the council's shared understanding that youngsters touched by the juvenile justice system are children and must be treated as such. I want to highlight the data behind three particular recommendations that you've heard. First, setting a minimum age of juvenile court jurisdiction at age 13, except for the most serious crimes. Data shows that 90% of cases filed for children below that age end in dismissal anyway, and that these cases disproportionately target Black girls who make up a quarter of all filings in this group. Second, mandating diversion for for most first-time misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies. Maryland's own data shows that children currently diverted do very well 
Nine out of 10 children succeed when they're kept out of the formal juvenile justice system. And finally, forbidding pretrial detention and out of home commitments for misdemeanor offenses and technical violation of probations with the exception of handgun offenses. Data certainly shows, currently shows that 40% of detention cases and over 50% of commitments are for misdemeanors. So these changes will be strongly decarcerative. Data shows as well that black youth are disproportionately held both in detention and confinement. So this will result in more black children remaining with their families. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the first panel. There are several more. Um, are there questions for the panel? Delegate McComas to begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering, I know that um, uh, in years past, and I know that there's been a significant concern about gangs and that when there's not the family unit that the children uh, join gangs because that becomes the family. And I wondered if, you, if there were some processes or uh, programs that can help um, this rehabilitation project uh, to deal with this issue or if your committee considered it or the commission considered it. I'll uh, defer first to the secretary. I think that Ms. Egan also wants to respond. Yeah, actually, uh, I think um, I'm going to uh, refer to, to Ms. Tolentino. Uh, we do have interventions that are community-based interventions that help with young people, uh, and we do connect them. So youth advocate program would be a, 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 men, a way to get in there and uh, work with kids and give them a pro-social or a positive um, uh, person to work with, or uh, you know, any number of other programs, ROCA in Baltimore City, the Choice Program uh, come, to, come to mind. But uh, Betsy, can you fill in uh, some of that? I will just add the bill also contains some provisions to make sure that we have a great continuum of programming to meet all the needs that our kids have. But specifically, we have a family peer support program that is really just directed to supporting our families so they can support their young people. So besides the programs the secretary um, added in, Delegate McComas, we can send you um, a list of all the programs. We have many um, of them do support young people who may be um, involved in gangs or um, have that kind of, need that kind of additional support. Delegate Nicole Williams, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, really quickly, I was looking at the comments from the judiciary and really, I guess more specifically, one of the things that they were saying is that this bill would limit, I guess, kind of the placement or disposition of a child. Um, you know, they're mentioning that this bill will prevent um, a placement of a child in say a foster home, group home, mental health treatment facility or residential drug treatment program. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Um, I guess, kind of criticism or whether or not that's even indeed the case, because. I'm gonna, I'll defer to Betsy, well, because she's here to deal with technical questions on the bill. Valentina. Okay. So the bill would prohibit the use of out of home commitment to the Department of Juvenile Services if the person is adjudicated of a misdemeanor offense um, or a technical violation of probation. What it does not do is prohibit um, use of facilities that are run by the Maryland Department of Health, um, okay. facilities run by the Department of Social Services. So if a young person needs to be committed to a different agency to, to really be connected to those types of services, this bill would still allow for that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Are there further questions for this panel? You're all getting off easy. Seeing none. Uh, we thank you all very much. Again, thanking everybody for all of your work on the on the council. Really, I do appreciate it. Um, what we're going to do, and I, for those people who are listening in at home, if you're on on the line to testify, uh, I know there are a lot of people who are very excited about this, and uh, and there is a person who's going to testify in opposition, but that's fine too. Um, we will encourage. Uh, if uh, someone else has said what you're thinking of saying, uh, saying me too means that you're associating yourself with what the previous people were saying, just, uh, just to encourage people to have a degree of brevity. But having said that, here we go. 
Stephen Bergman, Melissa Goman, Keisha Hogan, Krista Henning, James Green, and Eve Rips. We'll hear those six to begin, and then we'll take questions. There's Mr. Bergman. Mr. Bergman, you have two minutes. Um, and whenever you're ready, you go right ahead. Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair and committee members, my name is Stephen Bergman. I'm a lawyer with the Office of the Public Defender. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify in support of HB 1187, with a particular focus on the provision that would raise the minimum age of juvenile jurisdiction to 13. Let's talk data. According to DJS and FY 2020, 1,469 delinquency complaints were filed against children under the age of 13. The racial disparity in these numbers is shocking. If you take away only one thing from my brief testimony, I urge you to let it be this. Black children make up 35.8% of the Maryland student population. Yet, according to DJS data, black children account for twice that percentage, a staggering 71.5% of all complaints filed in FY 2020 against children under the age of 13. And then there's the issue of age itself. 324 complaints made to DJS in FY 2020 were for children age 10 and under. 93 were filed against nine-year-olds. 54 were filed against children age eight and younger. What public good does this possibly serve? And these weren't for serious offenses. In FY 2020, only six of the offenses charged against children under the age of 13 resulted in commitments to DJS, not a single one for a felony. In fact, of the six children under age 13 who were committed to DJS, four were for misdemeanors against property and two were misdemeanor assault charges. Despite this, in FY 2019, 50 children under the age of 13 were held in secure detention in Maryland. In FY 2020, during a pandemic, there were still 37 children under the age of 13 who were locked up in juvenile detention centers. This is simply not acceptable. We can do better. And I strongly urge the passage of this very important bill. Thank you very much. Melissa Goman, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Klippinger, Vice Chair Atterbury, and members of the House Judiciary Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of HB 1187 on behalf of the National Juvenile Justice Network, where I serve as the Senior Policy Counsel. The lack of a humane and rational minimum age for prosecuting children puts them at risk of experiencing the trauma and collateral consequences associated with arrest and police involvement. I've laid out in detail these concerns in my written testimony, and I'll highlight just a few of them now. One, children under 13 are not competent to understand and exercise their legal rights in any meaningful way, with one study comparing the competency of many 11 to 13 year olds with the impairment of seriously mentally ill adults. Two, as someone else has mentioned in Maryland, as is the case nationally, young black children are significantly overrepresented in the justice system. By prohibiting the arrest of young children, it would help to disrupt these justice system disparities and would also prevent large numbers of children from being arrested in school and sent through the school to prison pipeline. Three, rather than prosecuting young children, Maryland would do better to focus efforts on children's academic achievement and attachment to school, both of which are protective factors against problem behaviors whereas processing children at a young age in the justice system can actually increase the chance that they will commit future offenses. Four, the U.S. is an outlier throughout the world in the practice of prosecuting young children. The U.N. Committee on the Rights of the Child has recommended the nation set their minimum age of criminal responsibility to at least 14 years old and urge nations not to allow exceptions to be carved out. We encourage Maryland to join this movement and pass HB 1187, and also urge you to remove the carve-out provisions included in the bill for various offenses. A child's competency is not determined by offense, but by age and brain development, and prosecuting them at young ages for certain select offenses will only serve to harm them and to increase the possibility of future offenses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keisha Hogan. 
Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes, go ahead for two minutes. Okay, thank you. My name is Keisha Hogan. I am here because from 2013 to 2016, my, sp my son spent three years in juvenile commitment for a misdemeanor theft offense. First, I wanna start by saying that before this incident, my son had never been brought home by the police. It was his first time ever in trouble. During my son's entire trial, I was never once given the opportunity to speak on his behalf. I wanted my son home and DJS recommended he come home. Instead, he was placed in the care of individuals who lacked education and knowledge of how to manage children that had been ripped from the only life they knew. He had to deal with staff who lacked emotional empathy and some who displayed racial biases. I felt my son were kidnapped and mourned his absence. <clears throat> After one year, they recommended he come home, but the judge again refused. This entire situation was devastating to my family. I had to attend counseling twice a week for a year. I had to, uh, my daughter struggled to pass middle school while I dealt with having a young child at home. Once my son came home, it was like letting a caged animal out of his cage. He felt anxious most of the time, uncomfortable around large groups of people. He wasn't able to eat home-cooked meals for a month and, at, and suffered stomach issues. Ultimately, my son reoffended and is, was sentenced to the prison system the second time he offended. This is because the scare of doing time was no longer there. He was institutionalized. Everything could have been different if they had let my son stay with me in 2013 when he was tried at the age of 13. I would have made sure he got the help that he needed and he would have stayed safe. I lost time that I could never get back. I lost the opportunity to instill values as a young man that the juvenile justice system is not set up to do. My son was sent all over the state of Maryland creating instability and then placed him in institutions so far from home that it made it very difficult for me to visit, which is essential in the development of a child. What happened to my family was a total injustice and needs to never happen to another first time offender. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen Henning. Thank you very much. Indeed, my name is Kristen Henning. I am a resident of Tacoma Park, Maryland, and I am also a professor and director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and initiative at Georgetown Law. I am also the director of the Mid-Atlantic Juvenile Defenders Center. Now you heard two critical data points on racial disparity from Mr. Bergman, but let me add a couple more points just to really drive the disparities home. Black youth, although black youth make up only 35% of the population of 10 to 17 year olds in the state of Maryland, they account for approximately 75% of youth in juvenile detention facilities. In 2018, youth of color we're nearly twice as likely to have their cases referred to juvenile court intake, 50% more likely to have their cases petitioned, and 30% more likely to be referred for diversion. In 2020, they were 83% of children under the age of 13 who were held in Maryland detention centers. Racial disparities like this are common when decision makers are given broad discretion, ambiguous decision-making criteria, and little oversight. Implicit racial bias thrives under these circumstances and allows decision makers or causes decision makers to perceive black children as older, more culpable, more dangerous, less deserving of diversion, and more deserving of incarceration. By narrowing and clarifying the decision-making criteria for critical decisions, like the length of probation, the use of out-of-home placements, and the minimum age of prosecution, as well as expanding diversion eligibility, House Bill 1187 takes an important step forward in reducing racial disparities and ensuring that Maryland treats all children like children. This bill will not only reduce the number of youth in youth jails and prisons, but it will also reduce the psychological harm that has been documented in the research among youth of color in the system. Fear, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, poor sleep quality, and difficulty paying attention in school. 
This bill is necessary to help all young people reach their greatest potential. And I hope you will pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, James Green, now for two minutes. Good afternoon. I'd like to first thank uh, Chairman Clippinger for sponsoring this bill and express my gratitude to this body uh, for the opportunity to testify before you today in support of this historic legislation established using the recommendations of the Juvenile Justice Reform Council. My name is James Green Jr. And today I have the privilege of testifying on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success in Baltimore and my brother's Cheaper Baltimore partners in breaking down historic barriers to the success of Baltimore's boys and young men of color. Baltimore is one of 250 cities communities and tribal nations that are part of a national call to action initiated by President Barack Obama in 2014 focused on building safe and supportive communities for boys and young men of color communities where they feel valued and have clear pathways to opportunities to succeed and thrive. Along with leaders from local agencies, businesses, philanthropies, universities, communities, organizations, and youth, we are taking strategic actions to improve life outcomes for Baltimore's boys and young men of color in the four priorities following establishing an asset-based standard and the approach that we take to the narrative and how systems engage boys and young men of color, connecting community-based organizations serving boys and young men of color to a variety of resources to form and grow sustainable business models, recruiting and uniting credible mentors with boys and young men of color to help them succeed on their journey to college and career, as well as advocating for reform, uh, as well as advocating to reform Maryland's juvenile justice system, which historically dis and disproportionately detains and supervises Baltimore's boys and young men of color. House Bill 1877 has the potential to radically improve the lives of Maryland's youth, especially Baltimore's black boys. Black youth for the last three years have consistently made up about 70% uh, 70 of the Department of Juvenile Justice's population committed to secure facilities and placement, most of which are black boys from Baltimore City between the ages of 14 and 18. Baltimore's boys and young men of color also have the highest rate of recidivism in the state of Maryland. While we recognize the number of youth detained continue to decrease in, in fiscal year 20, the Department of Juvenile Services invested less than 10% of its $270 million annual budget into community-based services. Community-based diversion and interventions are known to have significantly better outcomes than detention. As a city, we are rich with credible community-based advocates working daily to intervene and divert youth from the juvenile system. We believe that this bill provides the opportunity for them to make even greater impact. For Mr. That Green? Yes, sir. If you would wrap up, please. Yes, sir. For that reason and more, we support House Bill 180, 1877. Investing in the potential of our youth and the credible individuals and programs in the communities where they live rather than in their incarceration should be our ultimate goal. Thank you for my time. Thank you. Eve Rips, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Eve Rips, and I teach in the Civitas Child Law Center at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. The Child Law Center trains law students and lawyers to be effective advocates for children and recently released a report submitted as written testimony about the importance of setting a minimum age for juvenile court systems. I'm here today in support of setting a minimum age in Maryland. Developmental research consistently shows that children face significant barriers in their ability to regulate their own behavior and to plan for the future. This impacts how children interact with justice systems in three main ways. First, it speaks to the fact that children are less culpable. Children face limitations in their ability to understand the impact of their actions on themselves and on others um, because our criminal systems rest fundamentally on the idea that you need to have the requisite mental state this research speaks to the fairness of bringing children into justice systems. This idea has been reflected in the centuries old defense of infancy under which children were frequently considered incapable of crime. Second, as Melissa mentioned, developmental research speaks to children's competency to stand trial. A leading national study from the MacArthur Foundation found that children aged 13 and under were much more likely to be significantly limited in their ability to participate in their own defense than older populations. And third, developmental research speaks to the fact that children are unlikely to benefit from traditional justice system responses and more likely to benefit from supportive services. A study group launched by the Department of Justice's Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention found strong support among practitioners for early intervention over conventional justice system responses in dealing with children. 
when we arrest and charge children, we're subjecting them to systems that they don't yet fully comprehend for behavior for which they're not fully culpable. This runs the risk of setting off a lifelong cycle of system involvement and trauma um, and can lead to putting children and their communities alike at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for this panel, the vice chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I was like toggling between screens and it was like way over there. Um, I just honestly wanted to thank Ms. Hogan for telling your story and I'm gonna get emotional. I saw you getting emotional. Um, I mean, one of the things that you talked about is what I worry about my son. He's nine and he's very big for his age. And I don't know that I think before I had kids, I actually worried about that. But I worry that he will do something stupid because he's nine and be misconceived and not taken as being nine. And I think parents of, you know, black kids, that's just a fact that we have to worry about it. And I know my parents worry about it and I cannot imagine what you went through. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for being here and telling your story today because it's so important. So thank you very much. Seeing no I really appreciate that. It, 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 is, it was extremely tough. <laughs> And so it's like it happened last week. You know, it is extremely tough. And that was my firstborn child that this happened to. So, and like I said, that time will never, I'll never get back. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hogan. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. Delegate Rachel Jones. I'm going to second what the vice chair just said, um, Ms. Hogan, and it was mentioned as children have a difficult time with emotional regulation in general, but my, my oldest is 11 and he's on the autism spectrum. Emotional regulation is incredibly difficult, and we have this conversation just about every day about how he processes his frustrations, and I have the conversation with him about how in this house, you are my, my boy, you're my sweet boy, but as you get older and you go into school and you go into the public, your behavior will not be understood by people who do not know you, and so the situation that you described with what you went through with your son is one of my biggest fears um, because we have a very difficult time in my house um, when, when things don't go just right for my son. And so I can't um, uh, stress enough um, that I'm sorry that you went through that situation. And I do hope um, that um, your testimony today helps to make it possible for other parents to not, and children to not have to go through what your family went through. Are there further questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very much. Again, thank you very much in particular, Ms. Hogan, for being with us today. We do appreciate it very much. All right, I'm going to go next to a group of eight people who will testify. Erica Chavaria, Elijah Miles, Vincent Chiraldi, Samantha Blau, Shelley Brown, John King, Ian Algarden, Emily Mooney, Let's see who I see first. I see uh, Elijah Miles first. So we're gonna let Mr. Miles speak for two minutes, please. Mr. Miles. How to use this thing. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak again. Uh, like James Green just came here, I'm a resident of Baltimore City, but I'm also uh, a member of the board of directors of my brother's keeper Baltimore. And I speak on behalf of that great organization today. Uh, so <clears throat> this historic piece of legislation, legislation, if passed, will remove one of the stumbling blocks in the ways of our boys. Court, even juvenile court, is no place for children, specifically black boys who are under the age of 13. At 13 years old and younger, most ancient societies, most societies in human history, uh, were taking this time while this these kids are figuring out who they are, figuring out their identity. We're taking this time to put the boys through rights of passage processes, wherein the boys would be trained and taught to be men, 
taught to be great contributors to their society, taught how to follow rules, laws, customs of that society, because those ancient societies recognized that the value of those boys to their society uh, was extremely valued and they had a whole lot of potential and they realized that their, their future was connected to them. However, in Maryland in 2021, we've forgotten that black children only make up 30% of the children in Maryland, but make up 70% of the intakes in those institutions. And so at this time, we're ripping the aid, we're ripping young boys uh, that could be learning about what it means to be a righteous man uh, and putting them in these institutions where they're learning how to be in those institutions for the rest of their lives. To offer an alternative really quick, last summer, MBK Baltimore ran a Rights of Passage program for black boys. We directly dealt with the population that people seem not to want to deal with, the so-called squeegee boys in Baltimore City. And through our mentors and our teachers, we guided these children, taught these children at moments, held them accountable. We didn't punish them uh, before they had the chance to understand right and wrong. We didn't throw them away or call 911 and have them carted away. We taught them and we found uh, that all they needed was direction, care, guidance, and love. And so we offered them that successfully. Me, myself, as a young guy, I only am. I only didn't go the way of gangs or selling drugs or the streets because of programs similar to that program. And so NBK Baltimore recommends that uh, we set a uh, that we do set that statutory uh, maximum length for supervision, but also that we refer them to a community-based diversion program so that NBK Baltimore, other great organizations in Baltimore can do what we have already been doing. Again, my name is Elijah Miles, represent representative NBK Baltimore, and I urge you to vote favorably on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Miles. Now we'll go to Erica Shaveria. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Erica Chavarria, a veteran teacher of 11 years, and I'm speaking today in support of House Bill 1187. I am appalled and disturbed by the data in Maryland regarding arrests and incarceration of children, particularly Black children, for low level offenses. It mirrors what we see as educators in schools where our black and brown children are disproportionately arrested and charged by school SROs. As someone who holds a master's degree in international law and human rights from the United Nations University for Peace, it is unacceptable that the state I live in is among the worst in the nation in violating the human rights of children. Instead of protecting our children and providing our young people with what they need to live productive quality lives, we are setting them on a traumatic path that derails their education, leads to higher rates of recidivism and destroys their futures. It is shameful we live in such a punitive society that views children, particularly black children, as disposable criminals, as opposed to human beings worthy of love, care, dignity, and support. By locking up our children, we are throwing them away and telling them that they are not worthy of the investment of resources and people who can support them and guide them. As a teacher, I am keenly aware that children make irresponsible and harmful decisions because their brains are not fully developed. Children also act out when their needs are not being met. I have many students who display behaviors that I address with care and love instead of anger and referrals. In doing so, I am able to discover the root causes of their behavior and provide them with the support that they need. As a trained practitioner and trainer of restorative justice, I know the importance of healing and trauma-informed practices in communities. We should not be arresting and detaining young children who have not even had the chance to learn how to handle conflict or their emotions in a healthy and productive way. I challenge you to think back to when you were a young person. Did you ever make an unwise decision? Do you believe your mistake warranted an arrest and lockup that would have detrimental and catastrophic impacts on your mental and emotional health as well as your future? We must focus our resources towards restorative and transformative justice and a preventative response teams of mental health workers, counselors, and therapists who provide our children with their social, emotional, and mental support that they truly need. We should be investing in diversion programs that actually address underlying needs and trauma of our young children once an incident occurs. I encourage this committee to listen and honor the voices most impacted by harmful policies and do the right thing by them. You have the opportunity to show through action that you value the voices and lives of black children. The passage of this bill is a perfect opportunity for Maryland to be a leader in our country in protecting our children instead of a leader in harming them. It is well overdue to finally reverse the harms to our children of the racist 1994 crime bill by raising the minimum wage of a juvenile court jurisdiction. This is the least we can do to move to towards a society that wraps its arms around our children, particularly our black children, instead of locking them up in cages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Vincent Schiraldi, for two minutes, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vincent Schiraldi. I am co-director of the Columbia University Justice Lab, former commissioner of probation in New York City under Mayor Bloomberg and Mayor de Blasio, former director of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services in Washington, D.C., the rough equivalent of DJJ. 
under Mayors Williams and Fenty. Uh, I'm also co-chair of two national associations, one focused on probation and another focused on youth corrections. I presented, I, I forwarded to the committee written testimony. So I, I'll just very briefly say uh, that I wanna applaud you for taking up uh, Bill 1187 uh, as, as a, a commissioner of both probation and juvenile justice. The folks sitting in my waiting room were a sea of black faces. When I ran DYRS in DC, not one white kid was committed to my custody in the five years I ran DYRS. Uh, it was absolutely appalling. And uh, I think what's so attractive to me about your bills and why I've testified today is that um, it's absolutely clear that the kids that are in there that are younger and that are in for lower level stuff, the misdemeanors, the kids coming in for technical probation violations are getting nothing out of this system but learning worse stuff. Uh, they're just being associated with deeper and deeper ends of the system. The system sort of draws them in in ways that is detrimental to them, is racially inequitable, costs money. And I think if you can put a, help put a stop to that through the passage of 1187, I think it'll be absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, wanna, I do wanna say we dramatically cut the number of kids in custody uh, in New York City under Mayor Bloomberg, who was no softy on crime, right? This was the same time he was engaged in stop and frisk. We took every single kid back from state custody. There are literally no kids in state custody from our family courts today. There were 500 kids in custody. We opened up a bunch of small nonprofit homes for them. Some of them were locked, most of them were not. Biggest one was 20 beds. Most of them were six and eight beds. And now there's a hundred kids in those. And New York City's got 8.6 million citizens. So you guys can do the math as to how that stacks up versus Maryland. Mr. Chiraldi. Hold on. Appreciate your kind words. Thank you. If you'd like to wrap up quickly. Just one final thing I'd say, I think Sam Abed is a terrific department, uh, DJJ administrator. I've spoken to him and his staff. Uh, at some level of frequency. And I think if 1187 passes, they'll do a fine job of implementing it. All right, thank you very much. Samantha Blau for two minutes, please. My name is Samantha Blau and I'm speaking today on behalf of the People's Commission to Decriminalize Maryland. Our commission's experts on youth justice could not be here today because they are youth themselves. They're in class right now. So I'm speaking on their behalf. Uh, the People's Commission asks that the law and the Maryland, Maryland's justice system treat all youth as they actually are, vital members of our society, people who are deserving of investment in a future. We ask that our youth not be treated as a problem to be hidden in prisons because some community members are uncomfortable with how they sound, how they look, how they act. We believe that this bill is a really excellent first step in uh, changing that dynamic and we support a favorable report. Thank you very much. We'll go now to Shelly Brown, please, for two minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, Shelly Brown? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, good. okay. Good afternoon, my name is Shelly Brown. I've been an attorney in, in Maryland for the past 25 years. I have represented over 600 children in matters including intake meetings, adjudication, juvenile waiver and transfer hearings. The youngest child that I've represented in court was 10 years old. The offense was a second degree assault on a playground at her school. The child was a typical 10 year old girl with a very short attention span and little ability to understand the situation. She was first brought to DJS approximately three months after the alleged incident for the intake conference. DJS recommended an informal adjustment and the victim appealed. Of course, the state had the discretion to petition the matter. The case finally came to court for adjudication nine months after the alleged incident. The case was continued because the alleged victim had moved out of state and the prosecutor deemed it necessary to fly the victim from Texas back to Maryland for a simple assault on a school playground by a 10 year old. After such time passed, her memory, her ability to correlate the incident with the proceedings was completely lost on my client. The case was closed and not in need of services. She and her family were traumatized and felt ashamed and embarrassed, but did not grasp or learn any lesson from the entire ordeal. 
A child of tender age has difficulty grasping the concepts to understand the nature of the offense, the nature of the proceedings, and the lack of capacity to assist in defense. The purpose of the juvenile justice system hinges on the accountability of the child. A child under 13 lacks the ability to understand the complexity of the law in order to satisfy the law's mandate to make a child accountable. As a parent, we understand that it is our job to protect, nurture, and teach our children right from wrong. But the court stepping in to usurp the parent's authority over a child at such a young age tends to label a child with a scarlet letter. The labeling of these children tends to follow and taint their relationships with parents, peers, and school. The possibility of a young child being removed from the home for an act that they lack capabil capability to comprehend the effect on themselves and our community is counterproductive to the goals of juvenile court. Therefore, I ask you to vote in favor of House Bill 1187. Thank you. Thank you very much. And John King, please, for two minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is John King. I'm testifying today both as a former teacher, principal, United States Secretary of Education, and as the founder of Strong Future Maryland, a progressive advocacy organization that works to make Maryland more just. I want to associate myself with the comments that you've already heard about uh, the problematic nature of our current system, the reality of Maryland leading the country and the incarceration of young black men and the relationship of the school to prison pipeline uh, to the policies that, that, that this bill seeks to reform. I want to emphasize how distressed I am when I see that two thirds of the young people who are sent away from home to youth facilities are there because of non felony offenses. I'm sort of stressed by it because it could easily have been me. Uh, I was a kid who lost uh, both my parents, my mom when I was eight and my dad when I was 12. In the period in between, when I lived with my dad, he was quite sick with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So home was this place that was scary and unstable. And I survived that period because of teachers and school. But when I was a teenager, like many teenagers who experienced trauma as a kid, I got in a lot of trouble. I actually got in so much trouble that I got kicked out of high school. I always tell people I'm the first United States Secretary of Education to have been kicked out of high school. And it would have been very easy for folks to give up on me, to say, here is a Black, Latino, male, family in crisis, going to, to city public schools, and what chance does he have? But I was blessed that teachers and counselors were willing to give me a second chance. But if I had been funneled into a system like the one we have today in Maryland, I would almost certainly be in prison or dead today. And the research evidence is clear. The evidence on adolescent brain development, the evidence on student socio-emotional needs. We should be doing everything possible to keep young people at home when we can so that they can get support and, so, and we should be doing everything possible to address their underlying mental health and behavioral health needs. In many ways, this bill builds on the work of the Blueprint for Maryland in prioritizing services over incarceration. And so I hope you will issue a favorable report on Bill 1187. Thank you very much. Ian Algarten. Thank you, Chairman Cliffinger. Um, my name is Ian Algarn. I'm the supervisor of the juvenile division in the Office of the Public Defender in Prince George's County. And I've been practicing in the Prince George's Juvenile Court um, since 2013 in the same courtroom where, as Ms. Hogan described to you earlier, her son was forced to spend three years in juvenile prison for a misdemeanor offense, even though the Department of Juvenile Services was repeatedly asking for him to come home. Unfortunately, what happened to her son was the norm in the Prince George's County Juvenile Court for many years. Um, the statistics I include in my written testimony show astronomical incarceration rates for children from about 2010 to 2015 um, because of kids being locked up for misdemeanors and for technical violations of probation. It was true statewide, but it was even worse in our county. We've made a lot of progress in the past four years to stem that. Um, but we're vulnerable to swing right back in that direction uh, if this juvenile justice reform bill is not passed. Um, the key statistic I provide in my written testimony is that during that time period, less than one in five children who were incarcerated in Prince George's were deemed a high risk of reoffending, which means that more than four out of five incarcerated children could have been safely given services at home. Many, 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 like uh, Ms. Hogan's son, who had the family support, the motivation, the access to treatment, 
she didn't even mention, but she uh, works in the mental health field and she had the, the resources to help her son, but instead she was taken out of his life. Um, these practices caused irreparable harm to our children, to our community. They wasted crazy amounts of taxpayer money and the burden fell entirely on children of color. Um, it's heartbreaking to see Ms. Hogan's son in adult prison now because as she stated, he was institutionalized by growing up in juvenile prison. Um, the recent history in Prince George's County demonstrates why we need reasonable limitations on judicial discretion. Sadly, in Prince George's, we've seen what unfettered juvenile discretion looks like. This bill places reasonable, moderate guardrails on juvenile incarceration, and it will prevent Prince George's and the state from ever uh, going through the mass incarceration of children that I've seen in my practice. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. And I, Emily Mooney. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Kobinger, Vice Chair Atterbury, and members of the committee. My name is Emily Mooney, and I'm a resident criminal justice policy fellow at the R Street Institute, which is a center-right public policy research organization that works to promote free markets and limited effective government. Given HB 1187's focus on rethinking and scaling back unproductive juvenile justice interventions in young people's lives with an eye toward promoting youth well-being, public safety, and fiscal responsibility, it is of special interest to us. Many individuals have testified before this committee speaking to data and research, and so I wanted to bring in some of the other states that have done similar reforms and have had great success. A juvenile justice reform package passed in 2017 by Utah legislators removed misbehavior like truancy, disorderly conduct, and some low-level misdemeanors occurring on school grounds during operating hours from juvenile court jurisdiction instead of mandating that behavior be addressed, instead mandating that behavior be addressed outside of the courts. The package also required pre-court diversion for youth referred for infractions, status offenses, or misdemeanors with some extensions. And it limited the ability for youth to be placed in custody or secure confinement and placed a four to six month time limit on terms of formal probation, among other things. Since these reforms have been passed, court referrals and admissions to detention have continued to drop. From fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2019, the rate of juvenile referrals and admissions to detention in Utah dropped by about 15% and 44% respectively. Meanwhile, the use of non-judicial diversion increased up to 56% in 2019. The state has been able to close a few facilities and is reinvesting millions of dollars in cost savings and front end services like family functional therapy because of this bipartisan effort. Kentucky also embraced similar reforms and legislation passed in 2014. Among other things, this legislation required the court to offer all youth referred to intake with a first time misdemeanor the opportunity to be diverted. It also allowed diversion intake for youth referred up to their third misdeme misdemeanor and some first time felonies. A subsequent evaluation of the reforms by the Urban Institute found that they dramatically increased the state's use of diversion, but that this expansion to more kids did not negatively impact a previously high successful completion rate or low recidivism rates. By mandating and expanding this point of diversion, the reform also began to narrow the racial and ethnic disparities at this point in the system. South Dakota also passed diversion legislation in 2015 that created fiscal incentives to promote county use of diversion, made pre-court diversion the default response to nonviolent misdemeanors or status offenses with certain, within certain circumstances. Good morning. I'll wrap up. An institute of system for some low level offenses with great success. I attached a brief with Utah's success rates in my written testimony and the Senate Judicial Proceedings will be hearing a written testimony from other individuals in, Kansas in Utah who implemented similar reforms. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Are there questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank you all very much for your testimony today. All right, the final panel in favor, Hannah Breakstone, Josh Rovner, Darrell Frazier, Angisa Ichile McKenzie, Zainab Chowdhury, Justin Nally, Oscar Taub, James Dole. All right, Hannah Breakstone, I see you. Why don't we go ahead and start there for two minutes, please. Hello again, and hopefully you all are able to hear me a little better this time. Um, again, thank you. I'm Hannah Breakstone here on behalf of Advocates for Children and Youth, and I'm also the coalition manager of the Maryland Youth Justice Coalition, which both observed the JJRC and also submitted a few recommendations throughout that process. 
Um, so, you know, I just kind of wanted to go back to the points that Jenny was making about, um, you know, the, the reduction in numbers that we have in Maryland. And I just want to make the point that it's not that kids have changed, but that we've changed the way that we see and treat kids. Um, and so I don't want to repeat my colleagues who have been here today. And instead, we'll just share um, a personal anecdote that speaks to kind of my why and why I'm here advocating today. Um, so in the past, I've shared my experience um, as a victim in a violent crime committed by a 16 year old. Um, we heard staggering statistics and descriptions of youth and families who, you know, have gone through that process. Um, very similar, right, to those that we heard, like Ms. Hogan's. Um, when I experienced this, I'm going to say I had the unique opportunity of also um, earning my master's in public health at Johns Hopkins, where I focused on racial disparities and actually conducted research on Maryland's um, juvenile system. Um, so my assailant, right, a child, he was held pretrial for six months before even receiving a hearing date with no access to services. He was placed on indefinite probation after his time spent, but, um, you know, after he was put in handcuffs and put in a cage, he clearly received a message of what awaited him in his life. Um, knowing his situation and understanding the system level impacts of some of the practices that HB 1187 um, addresses, I sincerely urge you to offer a favorable report on today's bill. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, we'll go now to Josh Rovner, please, for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon. My name is Josh Rovner. I'm the Senior Advocacy Associate at the Sentencing Project. As a District 18 voter and a member of the Maryland Youth Justice Coalition, I'm here to support HB 1187 as well as express frustration that a very good reform package ignored Maryland's automatic transfer of our youth into adult court. What is in this bill is welcome, if overdue, divert more kids from formal system involvement, eliminate low level charges from juvenile incarceration, keep kids under 13 away from the courts entirely, shorten terms of probation. These are changes that will further shrink the juvenile justice system. This language was built on the hard work of the Juvenile Justice Reform Council, on topic after topic, the JJRC found a system that is too large and marked with pervasive racial and ethnic disparities. None of this should have surprised this committee. I'd like to turn to automatic transfer, a topic under the JJRC's purview that also should have appeared in HB 1187. The reforms that are included will provide ample resources to address a set of youth currently sent to adult courts. It's important for the committee to understand Maryland's outlier status. Only two states automatically transfer more of their kids into adult courts without approval from a juvenile court judge or consideration of the youth's maturity. I'm not aware of any state that lists 33 separate charges for automatic transfer. Virginia eliminated all but a handful of charges, mostly categories of homicide from its transfer list last year. I understand that the JJRC would argue that it lacks complete data on the use of transfer, but this appears to be a stalling tactic that the committee can address. As with all the other issues in this bill, youth of color are treated more harshly than their white peers when it comes to transfer. And no study will find that charging youth as if they are adults helps these kids rehabilitation or public safety generally. We urge the committee to hold the hearings on Maryland's indefensible and counterproductive use of automatic transfers and express disappointment that such a reform did not find home in such an excellent bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Darrell Frazier, please. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Darrell Frazier, and it's a pleasure to testify on behalf of House Bill 1187. I am the Policy and Community Engagement Manager at the Mental Health Association of Maryland, which is a nonprofit education and advocacy organization. HB 1187 implements a range of reforms aimed at diverting young Marylanders from the youth justice system. Mental health disorders are prevalent among children in the juvenile justice system. A meta-analysis by Vincent and 
and colleagues suggested that as some juvenile justice contact points, as many as 70% of youth have a diagnosable mental illness. While there appears to be a prevalence of unmet mental health need in the juvenile justice system, the relationship between mental health and the system's in involvement is highly complicated. Youth involved in the juvenile justice system frequently exhibit elevated rates of substance use and mental health disorders. Many, many of the studies examining the issue have found that over two thirds of juvenile justice involved youth have a mental health diagnosis or need. Over 20% have a mental health disorder that could be diagnosed as severe. In addition to the youth mental health needs, we also find that youth of color are overrepresented in the juvenile justice system, which isn't surprising. For example, in 2013, while at the national arrest rate for white youth was 26.0 arrests per 1,000 persons in the population, the arrest rate for African American youth was 63.6% .6 per 1,000, nearly 2.5 times higher. While the rate at which mental health and behavioral health resources are used in juvenile just justice settings are highly low, it is even more deficient for African Americans and other minority youth. For these reasons, MHA supports 11, House Bill 1187s and urges a favorable report. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Angisa Ichile McKenzie, and if I mispronounced your name, I do apologize. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Chair Clippinger. Um, my name is Angisa Ichile McKenzie, and I'm a former teacher and an advocate um, via Southern Marylanders for racial equality. Um, I'm here to ask that you vote favorable on this comprehensive juvenile justice reform bill um, because we have to heal our children instead of punishing them to ensure that they grow up to be healthy adults. So I've observed uh, the harm that the family separation, the stigma, the educational neglect that this system has on our youth, a disproportionate number of whom are black children. Um, I'm not gonna give you the stats, of course. Um, I'm just gonna give you yet another example of the individual toll that this takes. And, and I feel the pain of the other um, speaker, Ms. Hogan, because my son is a black teenager who is on the spectrum, um, who I worry constantly about every day. So I taught a young lady out here in Southern Maryland who was um, in a residential facility because she had been arrested for assault. Um, she attacked the boy in school who had attacked her. And um, only the difference is she had scissors in her hand. So. Anywho, she was in a group home. She'd been away from her family for a long time. Um, I helped her catch up on her grade work because she had been in the system so long and put in residential facilities in so many different counties. She was based, I basically had to take her back through middle school to get her up to freshman year. Um, um, and she caught up, but she was a caring person. And on a couple of occasions, I had to bring my daughter with me who was really young and they kind of bonded over crayons and unicorn stories. Um, but I think it's because really she missed her younger siblings who she hadn't seen in about a year at that point. Um, she was depressed, she was isolated, um, but she still tried to hold on to her dreams of being in the WNBA or being a, a, a sports journalist, but she hadn't even been in school long enough to get started playing a season of basketball. Um, so, Basically, she had been thrown away and she continued to go to other homes after we were done working together. The last day I worked with her, she gave me a stuffed animal from my daughter. And on the back of it, she wrote, tell her to keep her head up for my child to keep her head up. And that struck me that I don't know what happened to her. I don't know how a child in this system that keeps swirling you around, unable to make roots, and get your footing with a stable peer group, stable mentors, even a stable doctor to treat your ailments, how that child is ushered into adulthood in a healthy way. So um, I'm not saying that the kid is perfect. She was a truant, defiant, at-risk kid, but she had value. She had natural intelligence and she deserved better than to be shuttled around this state of Maryland um, without developing fully as a person. Yes, so these, gotcha. Um, I, I ask that you vote yes on this comprehensive bill because this system can do better and we produce better outcomes by passing better laws. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sainab Chowdhury. 
Hi, good afternoon, Chair Clippin, Chair, members of the House Judiciary Committee. It's an honor to be here today with all of you. Uh, we'd like to thank Chair Clippinger, especially for your leadership on this issue. On behalf of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, I thank you for this opportunity to testify, again, in strong support of House Bill 1187. CARE is America's largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. According to Human Rights for Kids report published in 2020, as mentioned earlier, Maryland is tied with five states for being our country's worst offenders in juvenile justice. We need meaningful reforms now. We strongly believe that protecting the rights and well-being of children, especially young black children who stand to be the most impacted by this legislation in our state needs to be a priority. Black youth make up about 35% of the population of 10 to 17 year olds in our state, yet account for nearly two thirds of the age group arrested and charged. This is unacceptable. According to the Juvenile Justice Reform Council, our state currently has no minimum age of juvenile court ju jurisdiction. Children as young as six have faced arrests in Maryland excessively arrests pre-adolescent children. In fact, in the past five years, more than 8,600 pre-adolescent children have faced juvenile complaints. Our state's policies and laws regarding youth incarceration are unethical. They are costly, they're ineffective and harmful. They stunt rehabilitation, they compromise youth safety, they increase risk and cause and compound both immediate and long-term physical, mental, and emotional trauma. They impede academic progress, as mentioned during numerous testimonies of students who've been impacted by these policies. They increase recidivism and affect future employment prospects. We must explore non-carceral solutions, especially for our children's sake. Making this a priority will ensure better outcomes, not just for them, but for our society collectively. This bill will ban the use of jail time for minor offenses and allow our young people to return to their normal lives for personal growth and responsibility by accessing constructive, compassionate, and restorative processes. We support this bill because it places necessary limits between children and the law, and we respectfully urge your vote in favor of it. Thank you again, Chair Klippinger, for your leadership on this issue, and we urge the committee for a favorable report. Thank you very much, Justin Nally, for two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Justin Nally, policy analyst with the ACLU of Maryland. The ACLU of Maryland supports House Bill 1187, which will drastically reform the juvenile system. I commend those whose stories that we heard today and that um, that along with the data that was presented should be more than enough evidence to pass this legislation which centers the developmental and the social emotional needs of Maryland's children for years to come. So ACLU of Maryland urges this is a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions for this panel? All right, seeing none, thank you all very much. Um, I believe that uh, neither Austin or uh, Oscar Taub from MDAAP, James Dold from Human Rights for Kids, they had signed up, but they were unable to join. Uh, Vince McAvoy, uh, wishes his opposition to be noted for the record, and it is. That concludes the testimony for House Bill 1187. We finished at 312 today. We won't know what to do now. Um, <laughs> the vice chair is very excited. Um, the, uh, we, do we have hearings tomorrow? No, we have voting tomorrow. We are voting tomorrow. Uh, I think it's gonna be at about 4.30 tomorrow. We'll have a voting session. Um, and subcommittees will be continuing to meet, including the public safety subcommittee, which uh, will be meeting tomorrow, I believe at 12, 12.30. Oh, well, I can't read the vice chair. The vice chair can unmute for a second and tell me, yeah. 1.30. 1.30, oh, it was only my 90 minutes. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, Delegate McComas. I'm, I'm you just muted yourself. Please. I'm sorry. Uh Delegate um, Cham and I have an appointment across the street uh, around 4.30 ish. We'll go a little early, but uh, we don't want to miss this because uh, we know that yeah. we're, we're going to work around it. We'll be fine. Okay. You'll Thanks. Fine. Thank you very much. All right. So thank you both very much. Thank you all very much. And uh, that concludes the testimony today for the House Judiciary Committee. Thank you very much.